On today's show, we have new Infinity War news from China. Captain Marvel gets a new casting announcement. And Predator, he's back again. Get excited. Movie talk starts right now. <laughs> um, about that. I don't feel like the table here <laughs> is sharing my enthusiasm for the new Predator trail, mm. which we will talk about amongst our many news stories. That is Perry Nemiroff. That is John Roca. I am merely Mark Ellison. On today's show, we're going to get into all the latest and greatest in the world of movie news, plus your live Twitter questions. And we'll be joined by one of the stars of Cobra Kai, very funny comedian, Brett Ernst. We'll be sitting right here in about 30 minutes. But first, that new Predator trail that everybody could not wait to see. The movie opens in September. We had it dropped this morning and I watched it and I liked it and um, I didn't love it. I'll say that. I, I don't know what I was expecting. Uh, I think we got a cool looking trailer. I love the way that Boyd Holbrook's character is shaping up to be one of these, you know, top level assassins who's going to be so cocky going in fighting this alien who is not just a normal predator anymore. He is now taking DNA from other species and incorporating them into their own DNA. So that way we can do like this weird ancestry.com hybrid where you just have the best parts of multiple species of hunters. So so that way, when you come to Earth this time, you're not going to be beaten by Arnold Schwarzenegger cloaking himself in mud. Roca, Perry, I get to the studio this morning. I was very disappointed to hear y'all, but also Mark Riley, just a, a, a sourpuss. I'm going to say that. Wait, he was what? a little bit of a sourpuss <laughs> when he was talking about the trailer. He was down on it. He said he wanted more. <laughs> Roca, what did you want from this trailer? Did you get it? A good trailer. That's all I wanted. I wanted the trailer got me excited to, to revisit this franchise again, um, you know, because I love Shane Black to pieces, uh, Kiss Kiss, bang, bang, the nice guys, great stuff, Lethal Weapon stuff, even Iron Man 3, I enjoy his direction of that movie, but this teaser trailer did absolutely nothing for me. The only person who does stand out really well is Holbrook. I like his coming out of Logan, I, I was interested to see what he would do with this kind of lead role, and he does a nice job with the scenes that he's in, but then we get Sterling King Brown, hey man, I chew gum, so I'm cool, I'm a badass, so I chew gum. What are we, stuck in the 80s? Come on. And then you have the kid doing, oh, the kid's going to turn the ship on. The kid's going to crash things. All of it just seems so implausible and ridiculous. And it didn't seem exciting and interesting and fun or a new take at all. It just felt like, hey, let's just do this and let's see what happens. And even the almost kind of 1978, six, whatever, John Carpenter Halloween reference with the crane and the kids trick-or-treating, all of that was interesting. <laughs> you got the monster coming out. And I, I imagine that kid's probably Schwarzenegger's grandchild who finds this thing and blah, maybe turns it on but why does Schwarzenegger have it in a box in his attic so there's just a lot of issues that I had with this trailer that didn't excite me or get me on board but then again it's a teaser trailer so who knows what we've got coming when a full trailer comes out yeah Perry I'm pretty sure that a man named Mr. Wrigley would debate Roca that gum chewing was only cool in the 1980s <laughs> I also had an issue with the, the the child being the crux of this movie it's not just because I hate kids I do but it's also because <laughs> it's like now it's all his fault it's like oh okay it's it's you your responsibility that these aliens came to earth i just say yeah. it's not the right foot to lead off with rebooting this whole predator thing where some kid opens a dhl package and that's what gets the predators back to earth is that how you see this movie shaping up? i'm hoping that in regards to that single plot point when we see the full feature there's something more to it where mm. it isn't just he flipped the switch and that's why this whole movie is happening but i mean you brought up something that's worth reiterating at the end there we're judging a teaser trailer right now, just the teaser trailer. Just because I didn't like the teaser trailer doesn't mean I'm writing off the movie, and it certainly mm. doesn't mean anybody else out there should. But, again, we're judging the teaser trailer right now, and I think this was uh, a not-so-great way to kick off the Predator campaign because I've been waiting for this trailer, and at the end of the trailer, I'm like, who is this even for? Because yeah. as a Predator fan there wasn't really any kind of big reveal or build to get me excited. Like the idea yeah. of the hybridization, yep. that's the end point. And it felt like that line was just like lopped in there right in the middle, just so flatly put out there that yep. I, I didn't care and it sounded stupid. And then on top of that, you could look at the other side of it. Whenever you make more movies, you can't just appeal to the existing fan base. You gotta bring in new people yep. too. And I don't know who's gonna care about what happens in this trailer. I mean, even if someone is looking for some sort of sci-fi action movie, there was really nothing special about this. I think that's a great point you bring up. If you are a person who hasn't seen any of these Predator movies, this trailer is this teaser trailer is not for you because the teaser trailer kind of has the inherent belief that you've seen them, which is why they have that moment where you hear that 
attached to that sound of the trailer, of, I mean, of the Predator, they throw that in there to get you back into the vibe of the franchise. But if you're a person who's never seen any of these, I can't imagine that you feel any of the fear that or that the Predator is supposed to instill in you from having seen the first movie. Yeah, a uh, couple of weeks ago, we had uh, Danny Fernandez on the show, and she bravely admitted she's not seen any of the Predator movies. Yeah. And, uh, and, and we were trying to say, you need to see the first Predator, you need to see Predator 2. That's a good point you bring up, yeah. is that I don't know that this trailer sells a new generation on the fact that you need to see this iconic resurgence of an alien. I, I, I do sympathize with Perry's point as well, is that I like a huge reveal. Like, this, this teaser felt like it was a mix between a teaser that tried too hard and a full trailer that didn't really give us what we wanted, if that makes sense. Because yeah. a teaser trailer, I still think of a teaser trailer as you don't show a lot of scenes of the movie. You show a couple quick cuts and then you have this big reveal of, oh my God, Predator is back. I never really got that here. I just mm-hmm. got, it felt like a more of a stock kind of alien adventure as opposed to the Predator coming back. It felt like it was too story heavy. I mean, yep. you could even keep the Jacob Tremblay stuff and then keep the Boyd Holbrook stuff and those two two thing, things kind of merge together to maybe the hybridization realization, maybe you save that for a future trailer, mm. but some sort of epic looking reveal of the Predator, something that gives you chills as a fan or creeps you out as a newcomer to the franchise who just likes sci-fi and aliens. Yeah, yeah uh, as we continue to talk about this trailer, I think I like it less and less, which means we should probably move on <laughs> to Infinity War news. Infinity War is opening in China this weekend, and if the pre-sales are any indication, it's going to be a big one. It has already done $47.5 million in pre-sales. That is as of late Wednesday night in Beijing ahead of its release. And now all signs are pointing to it possibly having a record-breaking opening in China, which this obviously speaks to a larger symptom that is Infinity War and Avengers taking over the entire Earth. It's already crushing everywhere. With this news about how big it could open in China, it could be well on its way way to that magical two billion dollar mark that to my knowledge has only been matched by three other movies and that would be star wars force awakens titanic and avatar Mm -hmm. do you see it getting to avatar numbers Perry number oh, up. As if no. $2 billion wasn't no, no, enough. No, no. Now yeah. we need to break an all-time record. No, I, I don't think it's touching Avatar numbers. <laughs> Get out of my brain. Um, no She's av- the box office queen. <laughs> I want to hear I want to. I don't think Avatar numbers are in the realm of possibility, but given the pre-sale numbers in China, yeah, I do think it's probably going to hit that $2 billion mark. And you mentioned the three that have crossed it. If Avengers Infinity War hits the $2 billion mark, it would be the first summer movie to ever cross that, because all three of those movies came out around uh, December holiday time which would be kind of cool and you know I know Avengers technically is a spring movie but hey it's rolling into the (laughs) summer right now so that still counts but I'm really curious to see what that big number winds up being because even when you take into account uh, the Star Wars franchise Star Wars just crushes it at the domestic box office Mm. and the last few movies They haven't really impressed in China, which is a big piece of the pie right now. So Mm. if Avengers Infinity War winds up doing really, really well there, that just bodes well for for Marvel now there, right now, and also in the future. Yeah, it's a market you can clearly capitalize on from this point. Uh, You know, Infinity War is going to be big everywhere. The biggest opening for the MCU in China and the biggest run that any MCU movie has had in China is $240 million with Age of Ultron. It's looking to surpass that, Roka. Oh, yeah, I have no doubt it'll surpass that. And I'm going to once again be Crazy John the Baptist out in the wild, and I will tell you it was absolutely... Deep reference. (laughs) Way back. (laughs) Deep cut. You, know, you say it's going to beat Avatar right now. It will beat Avatar 2.6 billion, guaranteed. It will absolutely do that. And I think people love this movie, want to go back and see it. And the advantage with China is Deadpool 2 and Solo, a Star Wars story, will not open anytime soon in China. So if it, got, if it gets this kind of box office and Marvel movies do well, Star Wars movies do not do well in China. So it will be that will help it go globally, uh, get close to that Avatar mark, in my opinion. I think it'll beat it. The fact that it's doing it in the summer, it's destroying everybody's thoughts or predictions or what they thought was going to do in the summer. 
The fact that his first mo movie coming close to two billion, possibly crossing two billion as a summer movie, is incredible. And yes, we're stacked with a lot of movies, but there's something about Infinity War that really appeals to a lot of people and crosses all kinds of genders. I mean, all kinds of generations rather, and want to see it. And I think that's what is selling that movie. And no matter how good Deadpool is or Solo is, uh, I anticipate both of those are going to be good movies. I think people are going to come back to this. And when Ant-Man and the Wasp comes out, it might still be in the theaters and people will go and revisit it again to compare. So there's a lot that could happen here that will keep it going for quite some time globally. And I think 2.6 is not out of the realm of possibility. Does this change the conversation inside the halls of Marvel or really any movie studio for that matter when you see what a movie can do overseas when it appeals to international markets? Mm -hmm. Do you think that this changes their direction at all or maybe it expands their reach as far as maybe casting or plot lines or just the way that they present their movies from here on out? Well, we've seen that happen already with the casting of uh, Chinese actors, those kinds of things, but they most of the time they're, they feel shoehorned in. And I think what you see, what may be a blueprint here is a way to do it organically, make it work. You have Black Panther sliding in from Wakanda, it's an African nation, those kinds of things. Now we start to move into global. There are obviously superheroes from numerous nations in the Marvel universe. We'll see how they put that, for, but it has to be organic, it has to work. <laughs> well, to be fair, I mean, they had 10 years to get everybody yeah, in here. Well, if, if we didn't have all those other movies, they yeah. would have felt shoehorned in. Yeah. We had the 10 years of prior experience, and that's how you can get really any character you want to, and every character into this movie. Which yeah. is the cool thing about Marvel, and, and yeah, I know, like we're always singing the praises of Marvel, but this is what I like about <laughs> the company most, is that they had all of these years of foundation building, mm -hmm. now they're in the position to maybe take some bigger risks, go with lesser known characters, travel to different places, include different types of people, I, and I agree with you, Roka, I don't think they're ever going to kind of just shoehorn someone yeah. in just to appeal to an international audience, but there is no doubt in my mind that if this does wind up doing as well as they're suspecting in China, that, yeah, any kind of research team is going to look into that and think, you know, what was it about this one that popped, and hopefully take that into account in future films, because that's just smart business right there. And I think Black Panther reaffirms that, because a lot of people had not seen a, a black superhero all over the world. And so that those people came to see the movie, and that's evidence there. All right, so $2 billion is within the reach of Infinity War. The next movie to make $2 billion worldwide, well, it could be another Avengers movie. It, maybe it's a Star Wars movie. Keep your eye on Mulan, kids. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> Keep your eye on Mulan. I think that movie is going to do Bafo box office all around the globe. We move on to our next story, and anytime we talk about actors and actresses, we wonder, hey, doesn't matter what your prestige level is, when are you going to be in a comic book movie? <laughs> we have that conversation with everybody from Meryl Streep to Jake Gyllenhaal. Well, we have a new addition that is an actor, an actress, rather, of some note, and that would be four-time Oscar nominee Annette Benning is officially joining the cast of Captain Marvel. This according to The Hollywood Reporter. Her role is being kept under wraps as far as specifics go, but she will be playing some sort of scientist character, is the rumor. Roca, mm. what kind of tea leaves can you read about the character that well, Annette Benning will be playing? I think Justin Kroll, if I'm correct on Variety, he tweeted that it could be uh, Danvers' mom, right? It could be Marie Danvers. And if it's Marie Danvers, then we're going to be, this is going to be interesting because Marie Danvers has a very complicated relationship with Carol Danvers in the comics. Like they have a lot of, uh, a lot of people who know the Captain Marvel story, they know that one fight between them is like a legend in comics of a mother and daughter fighting. Like that's how it can actually happen. Anybody who's had a sister and a mom and like having them fight right in front of you is like insane the levels they go to. It's pretty fun to watch. <laughs> yeah, melting paint off the walls, <laughs> the things they say to each other. That's my experience growing up at least. But like that kind of, so you see that kind of, and so I think that this could be an interesting choice. But the other possibility is uh, is is the uh, Cobb, uh, the pilot that uh, Carol Danvers is inspired by, uh, and she she kind of helps. She kind of you know Carol like follows her and does those kinds of things. So they could go and mess around with that a little bit. And but if she's playing a scientist, how, how's that going to work? Is Marie Danvers going to be a scientist? Are they going to adjust the legend a little bit with that? So we'll see. Yeah, how much legend adjusting do you think that fans are willing to accept in something like Captain Marvel, given the fact that Annette Benning is going to be in the movie now? Legend adjusting, as in changing things from the source material? Yes. Not, I mean, I'm not the person to answer that question, because I don't, I don't, don't. I don't really care. The one time Perry didn't read the book. <laughs> yeah, really. I do, I have a lot of comics to catch up on. Everybody out there knows. I will try, I swear. <laughs> I don't care what role she's cast in, though, because there's no doubt in my mind that Annette Benning will bring more to whatever is on the page already, no matter how good it is. She is just one of those actresses that is at the level she is at because every single performance I've seen of hers 
really is mm. just something else, especially the last few years. I just have 20th century women stuck in my mind right now because right. no one saw that movie and she's so good in it. But the one based on your breakdown, Roka, the mm. one that intrigued me most was the pilot Cobb yeah. that she follows around because my mind immediately went to Wonder Woman and Robin Wright. And I love right. the dynamic between the two of them. So I'm kind of starting to picture something similar happening here. But really, Marvel is just crushing it with picking up actors and actresses like Annette Benning. And I can go through a gigantic roster of basically, you know, the people that you joked about at the beginning. It doesn't matter how high you climb in this industry. Clearly, Marvel is able to attract some of the top tier talent right now. And really, off the top of my head, I can't think of an instance where we're looking at, let's say, an Academy Award winner or nominee that was brought into the MCU fold and then didn't get some sort of opportunity to shine. Maybe they didn't have a leading role, but they always made an impression with something interesting. Yeah, and that goes all the way back to Sam Jackson as Nick Fury, in my yep. opinion. I mean, you look at more recent fare that we've gotten, Spider-Man Homecoming, Michael Keaton coming in sure. and, and lending really some some gravitas hey, to a Marvel or an MCU centric villain. Same thing with Michael B. Jordan in uh, yeah. as Killmonger in Black Panther. And then obviously what we got with Infinity War and Josh Brolin. Time of Lee Jones over in uh, Captain America: First Avenger, yeah. bringing his kind of weight to the role to center that film as well. So yeah, they do a great job. Hugo Weaving, Toby Jones, like all kinds of people have, have gone through these halls and been used really well. Um, the idea with Cobb is interesting because. How many mentors is she going to have? Because Marvel is supposed to be a mentor as well. And then, like, so if it's going to be Cobb, that's the thing that I have a hesitation about. If it's going to be, because I want her to kind of stand on her own. If we're constantly having her being mentored, I wonder at what point she breaks out. So uh, it, it, maybe there's an Earth mentor and, you know, Marvel a mentor, a Kree mentor. So there's all kinds of stuff that can play around here. Uh, a nice the, dynamic in yeah, that, too. Just true. the compare and contrast. Kind of like a of parents it. thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, I'm going to give you uh, the Buffalo Bills, the Minnesota Vikings. <laughs> And Annette Benning, what do they all have in common? <laughs> They've been to the big dance four times, and never come away oh, with gold. She has boom. been nominated four times for an Oscar, never won. Besides American Beauty, uh, which one of you two can name a movie starring Annette Benning that she's been nominated for that she did not win? Bugsy? No. What? She wasn't nominated for Bugsy? I'm just kidding. She was nominated for No, she was not nominated for Bugsy. <laughs> not for Best Sporting She was nominated actress. for The Grifters. Kids Are oh, All Right. Grifters is great. The Kids Are All Right. Perry Nemiroff uh, taking down the outlaw. Ha! And then uh, being Julia. In what? Can, can Enjoy. someone clip this out for me just sure. so I could play it to myself all the time and never participate in Schmodown? If Harlow was in the office, I'd have him come in and say, and you're a winner. <laughs> My career at Schmodown is over. <laughs> I have I'm sorry. I'm never going to forget this moment. Well, Good we job. Good winners job. and losers up here at the you're table. So and Bill and Ted are winners Thanks. and losers as well because they're winning. They're getting a new movie, Bill and Ted 3. Hey they're losing because they still have not written that one song that is going to change the fate of the galaxy a lot the planets they've had a lot of time by the time that their story picks up this according to some plot details that were just released they are still just chilling and they're hanging out this column is from adam chitwood in collider.com they're middle-aged men their medieval princess wives are now working double shifts at denny's hey <laughs> was a jedi council at denny's and they get a message from somebody from the future saying that they now have 24 hours to write that song. And if they don't do it, then all of the fate of the galaxy will be lost. So they get a great idea, knowing Bill and Ted. They decide to go into the future and steal the song from themselves. <laughs> and what ensues is being described as a Christmas carol-like journey through the past, present, and future of their lives. Perry Nemiroff, is this the description that you wanted to hear way back at New York Comic Con a couple years ago when Keanu Reeves was on stage and you were in the audience and you heard him say they're working on a Bill and Ted Absolutely. We spoke about this a little the other day, and I said, mm -hmm. you know, I like Bill and Ted, but I'm not attached to it to the point where I've been saying for years, I need another Bill and Ted. The more we talk about it recently, though, the more I think we need another Bill and Ted. And mm. especially considering our Predator conversation earlier, this is how you market and how you put together another film in a franchise because everything Solomon says in that interview, it's it's what you want to hear. We're not just making mm. another Bill and Ted movie to make another Bill and Ted movie. We're not just doing another copy and paste job here. Mm. We're going to bring something new. We're going to hold true to what made the originals so, so special, but we're adding another layer to it and just reading. I mean, please go read that interview because it really is very inspiring for a fan, for someone maybe who is 
isn't even that into it like I am, but just hearing the passion and how dedicated they all were, especially when they wrote that spec script when they didn't even have the rights. That's crazy. Mm. They put in all this work and then the studio that had it was actually trying to do a reboot and thankfully that didn't take off, but they were still working on it because they cared so much about the story and these characters. That in and of itself, forget the story points in, the, in this whole article, that just drive and dedication to what this is is enough to sell me on this movie. Yeah, most of the material gleaned in this interview was Adam Chitwood talking to the writer and producer of Bill and Ted. Face the Music is the, the name of Bill and Ted mm-hmm. 3. Uh, his name's Ed Solomon, and he also mentioned that one of the big reasons why this movie was able to get made now is because of so many different outlets covering the mm-hmm. possibility of the movie getting made. So it's nice to know that sometimes good things can happen from this business and you hear this description as Perry said does it get you out of bed and buying a ticket to the movie? I've been on board this train since we saw Keanu talk about it in New York Comic Con. He was really, this is basically the premise he laid out. I was really surprised at the gutsiness of this premise yes you might say oh Bill and Ted 3 gutsy no it is, it's gutsy because they're confronting the fact that they didn't live up to the expectations of their youth. How many men out there, how many people out there have go through that as they hit their 40s and 50s where they did, they they had all these dreams when they were in their 20s. They had all these expectations of what their life was going to be. And here they are with their children. Their, you know, their wives are working double shifts at Denny's. Those kinds of things. Because they didn't quite follow through. And they want one last shot at it. One last shot at it. And it's nice that this is going to happen. And I love that Keanu is 100% in support of this and wants to do it. It's a great premise. And Perry's right. Let me echo Perry's sentiment. Read this interview. Adam Chitwood did a great job with this. Solomon had some great answers. And the fact that they resisted it. I know it seems weird to say this. Like that it's a fun stupid little comedy about two dudes who like want to save the universe aren't the most intelligent guys but with great hearts that you like put some kind of noble stance and say no you're not going to reboot this thing you're not going to make a mistake with this thing and to hold out and fight to the end for this uh, I hope in the end we get a fantastic movie that comes from the heart that we all enjoy and the fact they want to go back to how the first one was an independent type of feature independent approach and the comedy is it's straight comedy and he said like nowadays we kind of need that and I agree we do we do need something Something fun and enjoyable and sweet again in the theaters, and so that's what it seems like. I don't know why you kept looking over at me when you're talking about men maybe not achieving <laughs> like everything that they dreamed about when they were in their 20s. I have not one, not two, five rec league championships. Now, sure, you maybe do. I thought they were going to be <laughs> NBA championships when I was 14, but damn it, they're still trophies. Do you guys think that everybody out there in the world, and particularly people younger than us who still have those dreams, are going to see this movie in the same light, or do you think they're going to look at it as like, what are these middle aged guys trying to do? Why am I going to see this? This movie, this feels like a, a cheap cash grab because as, as sweet as it sounds to us, yeah. I imagine that there's people, maybe the same people who are watching the Predator trailer and being like, what the hell is this thing? Do you think that Bill and Ted is going to have a multi-generational appeal or it's pretty much just a nostalgia trip for us oldies? It sounds to me like it can, especially with the daughter characters. Yeah. I mean, you could look you could look at you guys right now who are super fans of Bill and Ted and really want <laughs> it. I'm super, super old. old. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm not that much younger than you. Um, <laughs> Um, 23. So you guys are super fans. I'm somewhere in the middle. I like it, but I don't really care so much. And then I think with the daughter characters, that is their opportunity yeah. to appeal to a younger generation. And if they're thinking about this in a way where the story isn't just fun and silly, but it also has some depth, and they're constantly talking about themes, and that's why they picked that director, too, mm-hmm. because of his understanding of those themes. If all of this actually comes together in the way that he is expressing that they intend it to, yeah, it sounds like it's going to appeal to people because I also think that simply making a good movie has the power to appeal to everybody no matter what. Yeah, the father-daughter dynamic is great and you throw in the wives as well. You, the whole family, if the whole family is working to making this happen, it's going to appeal multi-generational and there's going to be illusions and jokes and things that could appeal to millennials and appeal to also who were watching it way back when and so that's going to work for it. That's a great point you bring up, Harry. And the fact they named their daughters uh, their their best <laughs> friends' names, in essence, Thea and Billy. It's it's perfect. Just who is going to be that person from the future? I just, yeah. I did, we asked it a couple of days we ago. Did. We got a lot of great suggestions. This is going to be another stand-up comic. Is it going to be like George Carlin as Rufus? Is it going to be somebody from the world of rock? Will it be Mick Jagger or Keith Richards? We're going to have to wait <laughs> to find out. Hopefully we get that casting announcement soon because I am excited for that as much as I am the rest of the movie. Well, if you're a fan of Friday Night Lights, maybe you played high school football in Texas, maybe you saw the 2004 movie directed by Peter Berg starring Billy Bob Thornton, or maybe you're a huge fan of the TV series that started way back in 2011, went through a number of iterations, and landed on its feet. 
Now you have a new Friday Night Lights movie to get excited about. It's going to be directed by David Gordon Green, or at least he's in negotiations right now. This according to Variety. David Gordon Green, obviously the director of the Jake Gyllenhaal movie, Stronger from last year, and he's also the director of the upcoming Halloween reboot that we're all very excited about. He's tackling Friday Night Lights, but this is not going to be a continuation of the previous film or the TV show. Is that the right direction to go? Because people seem to love that Mm -hmm. TV show. They really glean on to Kyle Chandler's coach uh, amongst all the other players and stuff that you really felt some emotion. I never watched the show myself, but a lot of people told me it's something to be right up my alley. Mm-hmm. It didn't get the views that it needed to stay on a network, but it found its feet, I believe, with DirecTV mm-hmm. towards the end of its run. People like the show. Why would you do a totally different Friday Night Lights instead of trying to get some of that mythology and canon into a new story? I wish I had an answer to that question. I love the movie mm-hmm. Friday Night Lights. I've never read the source material, but I did love that TV show. I that- have read the source material. I have. Mm-hmm. Both this is, oh, this book. is yeah. such a role reversal. It's blowing books. my mind right I've read now. Like that, eight actually, Tiger Woods books. that actually makes a lot of sense. Yeah. But sh- should I read the book? If you recommend it, I'll actually take your recommendation and read it. It's fantastic. Okay. Now you look back on it and Bissinger, it's like, it's like a time capsule of what, I, I think it was like the late 80s is when mm-hmm. he was actually writing the book. So, But it still feels very authentic and you can look at that and be like, it's pretty much the way they still do things. Well, thinking from the perspective of someone who's only seen the movie and the TV show, I think both of those can exist and be equally satisfying in similar ways and different ways. I just, I can't quite figure out why we would do another Friday Night Lights movie because you can't just do another. I, I think that the idea of this whole story and the Mm -hmm. themes and and just like the whole sport and the idea of high school football period in Texas that has this kind of never ending appeal Mm -hmm. where you can just continue doing that same story and it'll have that rousing finish and all that good stuff but there has to be another layer to it. And I wouldn't think that someone like David Gordon Green, who is, you know, he is riding a pretty high wave, especially right now, between how good Stronger is and also just the high anticipation with Halloween. Why would he sign on to do more of the same? That seems very unusual to me. So I imagine we're going to find out there's a little something special about this to make it stand out. Well, I mean, I, I think that there's a lot of fans that I would sympathize with, that, like the TV show, um, that mm-hmm. wants some sort of connectivity. But, you know, the thing about high school is that you ain't there for too long. If you're in high school right yeah. now, it might feel like forever. It's not. There's a whole other life you get to live afterwards, and it's probably going to be a lot better, at least if I can speak to it. <laughs> I had a great time in high school. Yep. I like my life now a lot better because I don't have to like, see people every day. Yeah. Um, so, Roka, do yep. you think that this should have any sort of uh, hearkening back to the TV show, or do you think it's best to make a fresh start and tell Friday Night Lights for a new generation? Yeah, I think so. For a new generation is fine. I, I, I don't know if we need any kind of reference to the past. Maybe Taylor Kitt showing up up in a scene or something would be nice, but I don't think it's that big of a deal. There's like a statue of Riggins like, <laughs> yeah, you can walk yeah. in. Uh, but I think it's that big of a deal, and I enjoy the TV show way more than the movie. I thought the movie was okay. It didn't quite grab me the way I thought it would, but the TV show really did, and I got talked into that. I resisted that TV show for so long, and then watched it, and I was just engrossed. I was tearing off six episodes at a time when I was watching it, so it's such a good show, and I can't recommend it enough, but I would say this. I think it's smart to do it now, actually, because high school football has changed so much from what it was before. Yes, the basic tenets of it are still there, but there's so much more money involved, so much more exposure. You're able to watch this now on ESPN Live. So much coverage of it. They talk about it on sports radio. These kids are looked at starting at peewee, peewee leagues. They're looking at kids and how they play, and they're scouting these kids really early. So there's a lot to play in. Plus, the uh, the social aspect of it, the political aspect, especially in Texas. All of that can throw in as well. Latino players, black players, white players, foreign players, those kinds of things are all starting to happen more and more in high school football. So where does that take us? So I, from what I'm seeing from the pitch, it's going to be a social exploration as well. So I think that excites me more than anything else, seeing a, what it's like in 2018 versus when he wrote the book originally and when that movie came out, what, over a decade ago? Yeah, I, I mean, you, you mentioned all the new things that are that are popping up right now in football as far as the inclusion of more the Branding. Yeah. There's also uh, you know a lot of uh, discussions around concussions yes. and, 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 and yeah. whether you should even be able to play tackle football. I wonder if if they want to tackle that. I wonder if that's one of the things that is is going to be the focus. I mean, I would rather have it just be about the team, you know? Right. As much as I, I care about that discussion, or whether it's CTE, and I really appreciate what the movie Concussion was trying to do with a high school football team, it's something that you just want to see a movie about sports, and you just want to feel inspired, and you want to go out and run 10 miles after you see it. Is that the kind of movie this should be, or should it be a little more social and politically oriented? I would be excited for that because I saw Concussion and loved it. 
I loved it. I, and I thought it didn't tell even... Tell the truth. I, it should have gone... Tell, tell the, truth. the truth. It should have gone farther. I loved it, but it should have gone even farther. I agree with that. Yeah, and I would have liked to have seen a real, honest exploration of what's actually going on. And But I think this would, would work. I actually would want to see And I think that's why you get David Gordon Green, because of what he did with, with Stronger. Mm. That's an exploration from a different angle. Yep. It wasn't this let's feel good Patriots Day movie. It was this is the real cost of what happened and the emotional in exploration that goes on with these human beings who are caught up in this stuff. Not everyone is clean. And I like that this could be a possibility with Gordon Green. Yeah, Perry, do you feel the same way? Somebody that's better at sports than Roka, do you feel the same way as he does with this movie? I'm a little less injured than he is right now. Um, I'm, I'm on the fence about it because when I think about Friday Night Lights, maybe a little less so with the TV show, just because as the TV show continued, you did need to have new issues crop up all yes. the time. But if you're talking about one contained story, I think there is an opportunity to have that inspiring sports movie that's strictly about the team. If naturally it doesn't call for any of those other elements to come into play. But if you're doing more of an epic and it's set in modern times, it's going to feel a little funny and slight, not to include them or even mm. address them in the slightest. Um, we're getting a lot of comments about this and all the stories. We love when you guys comment in the live chat or on YouTube after the fact. Uh, Roka, a lot of people are using a football story uh, as a chance to eliminate the fact that the Washington Redskins are the worst franchise in the NFL. That's what we're hearing. And given is, recent news, it's hard to disagree. It's not the worst franchise you. in the NFL. Uh, it, it, they're we're, pretty... They're, we're, we, we, we ain't Snyder. run well from the top. Yeah, yeah, it's Snyder. Snyder's terrible and bleeds down from the top, absolutely. Yeah, yes. I also had uh, people say that uh, if I have not watched the Friday Night Lights TV show that I am not a real sports fan. <laughs> you know what I was doing when I was not watching the Friday Lights it's a TV too show? I was actually watching real sports. No, no, no. Not wrestling. Real, actual oh. sports. Ooh. Give it a shot. I don't think you're going to regret it. Not sports entertainment because sports on their own are entertaining mm. enough. Well, something else that's very entertaining that we can all come back together, hold hands, and sing Kumbaya to is watching T-Rex's fight in the wild. That's what we got with a new spot for Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. Dr. Ian Malcolm is warning us that we've entered a a, a, a new era by resurrecting the most lethal predators that this world has ever seen. Perry Nemiroff, you love Jurassic Park. You love Jurassic World. Fallen Kingdom. We've seen a lot of TV spots. Where does this promotional material rank in your all-time favorite? My love for the original Jurassic Park does not cloud my judgment when it comes to these promos because <laughs> the Jurassic World promos, some of them have been okay. None of them have been all that great until I saw this TV spot. This TV spot to me feels like the perfect marriage between the original Jurassic Park and the direction they're heading in right now. I think the Ian Malcolm voiceover narration was done so, so well where it so mm -hmm. clearly mirrors certain speeches he has in the original movies. Mm -hmm. I'd love where that really iconic, well-known theme song kicks in. And then to end in a part, end in this with a T-Rex facing off against a lion, it was just the perfect path for something like this. And it it really was the first piece of promotional material for Fallen Kingdom. Again, I didn't dislike every other thing, but this one in particular had me like, yes, yes, I'm so excited for this. Okay, Perry's very excited. Uh, Roka, what mm -hmm. are you, come on. Were you literally checking your Instagram while Perry was gushing about a movie <laughs> that she really cares about? How many I'll likes did what, you get, Roka? What this movie does, or what this promotional spot does that the Predator trailer didn't, is that it sells what the movie is to a large audience. You know you're getting a lot of dinosaurs fighting each other. Predator, not so much. What say you? Let me tell you. It's going to shock the world. Perry's right. The, I, have, I have hated every single piece of promotion for this movie. I hate this franchise. I only kind of like the first movie. Every other movie is terrible. But this TV spot makes sense to me and got me interested. Chris Pratt saying this must all end with Ian Malcolm's uh, voiceover worked for me. And I like the scene of T-Rex with the lion. That's brilliant. You didn't see the lion go, ah, ah, ah. Yeah, I liked it. We didn't see that. So I'm cool with this. Maybe I'm slightly more interested now to see the sequel. We'll probably have to go anyway, but like I, I, I'm interested now to see the sequel. The TV spot worked for me, so I'm surprised. I'm, no one's more surprised on this panel than that the TV spot worked for me than me. <laughs> I feel like I'm in, in an alternate universe right now. He just said I'm right, and I'm also the unofficial Schmodown champion. No, 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 no one said that. No one said you unofficial <laughs> Schmodown champion. On the, right. We're, we're wait, wait. live now. This is, this is one of the rare live Schmodowns that has taken place, and Perry bested Rose. To be Son fair, I'll turn it back around, and I'll say 
truly, I'll always root for you. Thank you. Seriously, I have all the faith in the world. Thank you. He's he's the champ. He's okay. the champ. Um, I'm, I'm gonna say it. I'm gonna say stand root for by it. Roca. Do you guys think that people are gonna be rooting for Fallen Kingdom in the way that's gonna get it to anywhere near the box office of the first one? Because I I never thought it would get close to those numbers because the first one shocked the world by getting over two hundred million dollars opening weekend domestically. Yeah. However, you keep watching these promo material, and and we're not even into June yet when the movie comes out in late June. Do you think it's got a shot now, or do you think it's going to be maybe around the 150, 160 mark? I think it's going to make a lot of money. I have a hard time imagining it topping what the first Jurassic World did, because to me, even as a huge Jurassic Park fan, that still felt, you know, not necessarily like a fluke, but I was surprised that there was so much interest in that franchise Mm -hmm. still. But, you know, like we say all the time with these early tracking reports and box office predictions, let's say they premiere this movie and it is just blowing people's minds that's what I think could give it that added boost to get it closer to, if not past the original Jurassic World's total. Yeah, I think you can look at Star Wars as the template. Like, Force Awakens blew the doors off. Everybody, No one saw that coming to the extent that it made the money that it did. Jurassic World's the same thing. I think the sequel, same thing will happen like what we saw in Last Jedi. It won't quite get there. It'll, it's got interest, and people love this franchise, but I think the backlash has grown since Jurassic World came out against this franchise, and it's gotten louder and louder. So I think don't think it'll make the money that did before, and if it comes out, it's a terrible movie. It's gonna sink. Does it's that backlash make noise outside of these halls? I mean, yeah. you know, because we're we're in a very movie centric space, and when we go to you know premieres or we're hanging out apart, it's usually a lot of us you know, in a conglomerate talking about very inside baseball mm-hmm. kind of stuff. Do those conversations bleed over to the mass public who this movie is clearly marketed towards? Yeah, I think they do. I get DMs all the time from people who don't live in our sphere who talk about this and have a back and forth about... Your DMs are open? Yeah. All right, you yeah. heard it here Someone first. Someone said that to me the other day, too. Slide I don't understand. There. Why wouldn't you, D- like, have your DMs open? I, I guess some people don't... I guess maybe they get some messages or whatever, but I always... There's a lot of reasons. I train my, I train my fans not to come at me with bull crap. So oh, you train your fans. I do. That's how oh, I that's look good. at it. Because I mute them or block them if they mess around. But if they come at me respectfully to DM, then we'll have a back and forth. Nothing wrong with that. All right. Well, uh, you may have a different opinion than a lot of other people out there as far as what you get in your DMs. I'm going to remind you guys at the end of this show, we're going to save some time for your live Twitter questions. So do not slide into our DMs. Just simply tweet us with the hashtag Collider Movie Talk. Tweet us at Collider Video. And we love to hear from a lot of variety of movie topics, anything else, particularly from the Karate Kid uh, area of debate today, because we're going to have Brett Ernst pop in here in a second. Before we get to that, uh, quick story to close up the news segment of the show with bad boys for life it's been confirmed or at least we have a new release date january 2020 is this movie going to happen with will smith and martin lawrence is josh mcuga <laughs> finally gonna have his dream realized as an adult it better happen soon these men ain't getting any younger <laughs> let me tell you something right now listen i i i, I hated lethal weapon four because i had to believe these old dudes were running around trying to solve crimes you don't even start me on will smith and martin lawrence trying to do it and, and if anybody can find me martin lawrence please do i, I want to see what happens here uh, i'm excited to see them come back together but it has to be believable like bill and ted they have kids they have wives so they better have that kind of situation going on with uh will smith and, and martin lawrence so do i think it's going to happen yes i think the power of will smith once he signs on absolutely what happened. Perry Nemiroff? Following up the Bill and Ted story, you never say never with something like this, but we've talked about this new Bad Boys movies so yeah, often, I mean, and really. it's fallen apart so many times that I will believe it Probably not even once everybody officially signs on the dotted line, but when the cameras start rolling. <laughs> well, we talked about Bill and Ted for years, and then we finally get confirmation that movie's happening. So, Josh McCuga, we know you're watching, <laughs> eating your Fruit Loops. Hopefully, your movie comes out in January 2020, like it's currently scheduled for. There's a movie coming out on May 25th that a few of us here at the studio are fortunate enough to go to the premiere tonight, and that is Solo, a Star Wars story. Roka, stop making that face, all right? I'm about to thank you. So, Roka here has due to signed up and said, no, I will not go to the premiere. Why? Because there's fans out there that need to know the social media reactions from people who did go to the premiere. So while I am just going to be watching a fun outer space movie and probably getting hammered at the after party afterwards with free drinks, you are going to be working here in the studio doing the social media reactions. Tell us right. what that's going to be like. Yeah, uh, Dorian and I, Dorian Parks Knight, one of our new employees here at Collider, he, we, me and him, we're going to scour the internet and on Twitter and find social media reactions and let you all know if this is something to 
to get excited about if the people who love Star Wars are loving this movie. Even people who are kind of hesitant about Solo loved it after seeing the movie. So, and we're not going to spoil anything. We're just going to give you general overall ideas of what people's reaction to this to this movie was. If you saw our my one with Mark Riley, we did the same thing for Last Jedi. So I'm excited to do it again for Solo, a Star Wars story. So yeah, tune in and we'll have some fun fun time with you all and let you know if this is something you need to be buying pre-sale tickets for immediately. Uh, we take our hat off to you, Perry. We go in limo, we go in UberX. <laughs> What do you think for just, tonight? Just rubbing I just want, it in. I just want to get there. I'll have a drink for you, Roka. Okay. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, well, I would post it online, but I have Sprint, and apparently it doesn't work anywhere in the greater Hollywood area. We also have a Deadpool 2 exclusive screening, and IMAX is going to have a Q&A with director David Leach immediately following it before the movie comes out. For more details on how you, the fans, if you're in the Southern California area on May 16th, want to go to that, just go to Collider.com. And the movie trivia schmodown. It is live, returning to the El Portal Theater on June 2nd. We have a star. Star Wars match followed by a headlining match with Team Action and Shire Wolves. Here's a quick tease. Shire Wolves owe us lunch money and we will be taking it at that event. Whitworth, the system, the clock, Harlock, none of these guys can get in front of my destiny. I have to keep reminding myself. He's going to play the young Han Solo. All right. That is the movie trivia. You can get tickets in the link in this vid's description. June 2nd, Chris and I will be there hosting it. As we close out the show today, I am very happy to welcome a good buddy of mine, one of the best comics in the country, and he is also one of the stars of the new YouTube Red series, Cobra Kai. Mr. Brett Ernst yeah. joining us hey. here today. Hey. Makes a little bacon. Huh? How's it going? We don't want to block the gold. Uh, you I, were just talking about the time that you and I. Yeah, you you let me open for you many times at the La Jolla Comedy Store. Um, this is something I don't think you could have ever expected when you first came across Christian and I doing Schmoes. No, do you remember the first movie that you reviewed? Absolutely. With us, it was uh, Casino Royale. Yeah, nice. And I was in my uh, Mustang. Yeah, yeah so we had, we, it wasn't just in the Mustang. I think he had a tank top on, and I had a flip cam holding him in the Grove parking lot. He's got. It looked like a boy band reunion <laughs> shoot, and <laughs> it, it was it was Quantum of Solace actually. Oh, it was, so yeah, it was Quantum of Solace. The second one, right? That's right. So you you now you're in this uh, this show that has just taken the internet by storm, Cobra Kai. When you were a kid, were you a big Karate Kid fan? Did you see the movie in theaters? What do you remember about that experience? Absolutely, man. I was a uh, well because. Yeah, you know, I was Italian and well, half Italian and and from New Jersey, and I was raised by a single mom. There was that uh, that thing that I I always used to say that Daniel Larusso's mom reminded me of my mom. <laughs> you know, I'm just like, hi boys, <laughs> nice car, Miss Larusso, yeah. <laughs> or those your friends, Daniel? You know, that's how my mom was. And then, um, yeah, I mean, you know, you couldn't be a fan of uh, of John Avilson and not like you know the Karate Kid and. You know, I'm a huge Rocky fan. It's the number one movie of all time, as far as <laughs> any, everyone's concerned. Based on a true story. It is, based on a true story. That's right. Chuck Webner, that's right. <laughs> but um, we, um, yeah, it was just, it was pretty cool, man. It so when they come cool. to you and they say, hey, uh, we have this role that you're perfect for, Cobra Kai, I mean, is that just like your childhood and your profession? Because you've acted in a, in a lot of stuff. Obviously, you've been a headline comedian for decades. Is that just your entire life colliding into one great thing? I, uh, you know what, man? I wish it was. I wish they offered it to me. I, I, I had to audition <laughs> like everybody else and then <laughs> go to get tested. But I didn't know. I got to be honest with you, man. Um, I, I knew it was good. I read the script. I had no idea that it was going to be this good. Have you watched all, all of it yet? I have not watched all of it yet. Yeah, Perry is blazing yeah. through it yes, right I now. Am. That young man over there yeah. not only watched all of it, I think you've watched all of it three times. Absolutely. So I know you're very excited to talk to Brett today. Yeah, too. I mean, it's a, so. Like, I, my thing is this: like, I'm a massive fan growing up as well. Karate Kid has spoke to so many. I'm not Italian, but uh, but I, I liked it so much of the story. What was it like for you to come face to face with uh, with uh, Machio and work with well, him and all that? Kind I of, flew in Atlanta and then. Uh, they were like, all right, get ready. And my first scene is that one in the in scene one when they're the first time they face off yeah. in thirty something years. And then I, I was standing there, and uh, Dan Ahood, you know Dan, Dan, oh yeah. And I look over, and 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 we're like, it was just surreal to be yeah. like, you know, 
Machio and Johnny are, are facing <laughs> off right now. It's like being in the Millennium Falcon awesome. and seeing Han and Chewie yeah, enter. Yeah, yeah. Like, and, and, you know, this is and they're just acting like we're this is again. normal. You know? <laughs> but no, it was it was cool, man. And then you know you had the guys, uh, you know Hayden, Josh, and John, the, the guys that uh, did Hot Tub Time Machine, and yeah. uh, Harold and Kumar, and then uh, it's Overbrook. So Will Smith is involved, his company. Because wow. you know that because oh, he did the yeah, 2010 yeah, one with yeah, his I son, think they right? Own the IP or yeah. leasing it? I don't know how that works. <laughs> uh, but I, I, like I said, man, if you watch it, you yeah, they the the writers really nailed it. Bro. Well, they make it work. We just talked about this. The, does Bill and Ted work for this generation and the generation that watched another 80s property? But they do such a good good job with Cobra Kai, making you go into that world, but still making it modern because all the stuff that Johnny confronts that he's trying he can't be cool. And this was the guy who was the coolest guy in school at the time in the original movie mm -hmm. so you know so how you have the relationship with macho all the stuff that's going on there with LaRusso all the things you're doing it's interesting to see like how it all works through and then appeals to modern day and also has enough tidbits for those of us who were grew up during that time appreciating the movie and the cool part is they're both right and they're both yes mm -hmm. yeah. you know what I mean and and you really see Johnny's perspective uh, it's just really cool man they, yeah. they really the writers really knocked it out of the park man I, and you know I, I think because it was I, I it was better than good, and then everybody was like it may not you know the fanboys were already gonna oh, pounce yeah, yeah. on it. Don't mess with my childhood. Like, <laughs> Fifty something year old man in a basement, you know. This movie inspired me. That's not my Larusso. <laughs> yeah, that, that. And they're all ready to go, and then it was just so dope. Yeah, that everybody's like, I can't believe how good it is. You, you know what makes me mad too? Like you, you read some of the the you know people. I wanted to hate it. <laughs> good, good. Thank you for being open minded. You know what I mean? You, you, you ever see that? Like, we really wanted to hate it, but you can't. Right. That's all we get day in and day out around this That's place. the yeah. worst way to go into anything. Absolutely. From your perspective at all, were you aware of just working with YouTube Red? Because this yeah, yeah. is such an exciting thing for them in particular. They've been making original content, but this is something that crosses a line that they mm -hmm. haven't before. From what I'm understanding is that they have, they have other... Uh, purchase like mm -hmm. I don't know this to be true yeah. I don't have any I don't talk to any executives you heard it here first folks <laughs> <laughs> but I've been I've been hearing that uh, they have it like a bunch of um, other IPs like you know other shows that mm -hmm. they're gonna start rolling out and um, I think they were smart I mean they gave the first two away yeah which which is it's almost like you know a drug dealer going here's a taste <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know and, hey man you got any of that uh, <laughs> you got any, any of that, that Cobra Kai Cobra Kai, that karate? <laughs> Cobra Kai is actually like a great name for a drug yeah. don't try at home, kids. But if you're selling drugs, you just happen to fall into that line of work. Cobra Kai is a good. I'm buying. Yeah, the little the little bag has a, a, a snake. On it. <laughs> no, um, and then oh, what was I saying? Oh, so I think they're going to be rolling some stuff out. And you know, you have all of this uh, these streaming services, but then YouTube TV in itself, yeah, uh, is pretty dope. I have got you, it for this did, for this series. I got the YouTube bread for this series. But if you got like it, people that perfect. use uh, what's it called the. Uh, the thing, the Apple, TV, Apple TV, oh, with the Roku. Oh, cool. that's, that's how you know you're old. Friend. The thing with the with the with the button. How do you tape the sling. VCR? Sling, the sling, sling box. Oh, yeah. Yeah. People that are using sling, right? PlayStation. Uh, yeah. You should go over to, I mean, to, to YouTube Red. I mean, YouTube TV is pretty dope because it yeah. has a recorder and all the same channels, like a lot of sports channels, mm -hmm. and you get YouTube Red. It's forty I, bucks. I, I should I should work for the company. I think uh, <laughs> I, I think as tough as that audition must have been because you're probably nervous auditioning for a karate kid thing. I think it was probably tougher getting you to figure out how you could actually watch the show that you're in, but you've managed to master that <laughs> with YouTube Red and then YouTube TV. I mean, I, I echo Perry's point because, like, a lot of people from from my generation, from yours and older are like, what? but YouTube, like, I remember when we started doing schmoes, it's like, w w what is YouTube? That, that's not yeah. even a thing. And then it just starts to spiral in and people start to take notice of it. Mm -hmm. So the fact that we're here now, do you think it lends itself to more creative people getting their, getting their content out in a way that actually is going to be seen by all audiences I mean I, absolutely I think uh, this is I think this is the best time to be an artist right now I mean even as a comic because the the cre you don't you don't have those gatekeepers really blocking you I mean you do there's an easier path mm -hmm. if that makes any sense you still have like people that are like here's the money go shoot it but at the same time um, you're a, as a comic which is separate from from you know anything else it's the internet's there man just get the content out mm -hmm. Um, but I do feel that I, it's such a weird time in our general in, in, in American history where like the fathers and the sons and even some grandfathers are watching the same stuff, listening to the same music, mm -hmm. like playing Madden, 
You know what I mean? We're because I'm of that video game generation, the hip hop generation. We still haven't left that. Yeah. And you know, if you ever listen to like serious radio, the the difference between the fifties, the sixties, the seventies, the eighties, everything is just so significantly different mm -hmm. from the movies to the TV shows. And now it's everything is like homogenized now. Yeah, and you see like you see father and you're like grandfathers and grandsons mm -hmm. and the same thing, you know, mothers and daughters, and they're all going to the same movies. And a mm -hmm. lot of that, some of that is just nostalgia based. I mean, you have it, it, Disney and mm -hmm. Marvel and Lucasfilm. They're releasing all these huge live action movies that harken back to our childhood. Yeah. And you would just hope that the appeal would not be to like the 50 year olds, like you said, in their basement who are hoping to hate something. It's people who want to recapture a little bit of their youth. Well, and, uh, and two, you know, you get these these grown people that, you know, you can't recreate the magic of your childhood. But when you look at like the Avengers Infinity War and, and people that were fans of comic books, yeah. they when we were coming up, you were praying for these movies. Mm -hmm. You never got them. And they were horrible. Remember Spider-Man with the, with the big eyes? <laughs> yeah, that came out. And he school. was just yeah, he was running around. It was awful. Nicholas Comic Hammond, book dude. movies in the '90s when we got Batman in '89, we're like, okay, well, we're not getting another one like this yeah, for 15 yeah, years. We'll never see this again. Yeah. It, yeah. Was, it was like '78 to '89. It took us to get it right again after, since that first Superman, and to get it right in '89. The but the, yeah. but you're getting to see a, a lot of our childhoods now um, coming. But you know, like, look, my wife came into the movie cold. She didn't know anything about the Karate Kid. I mean, that does to watch the, when we went to the premiere. Mm. And being a fan of, of it, and uh, we, you're both invested. I think if you're a fan of the movie or you know the movie, y you're gonna get more. Yeah, you're gonna notice more things. But if you're not, you become invested into like the kids. Because as this as it goes, I don't want to ruin it for you, but it's it's really they did they did such an awesome job man. well they have universal it's, themes right the kids doing what they're doing but also the older guys like well this is where I, I forgot the lessons of my youth I've become this in order to survive LaRusso with what he's confronting you know he's kind of become almost like the a-hole they turned it around and where Johnny is like an alcoholic trying to figure things out he was this high school quarterback or in essence and so to see him so you get that the cross generational stuff that really works I do want to ask one thing, one thing though with did you as a comic as did they did you contribute any lines did you adjust your script did you with the characters you're on five of the episodes so like were you able to kind of hone your character yeah oh pretty that's much great. like I, I was able to the writers were like yo what would you do like the, <laughs> here's like, a blank page but like the go like the the thing that i added with always referencing movies yeah like you know i said ghostbusters and then you know yeah i'm always referencing so that was something. your idea oh, well yeah we, we, were, we were on the thing i mean i don't want to take credit away because it was just little ad libs but they they were they were open to that. They're like, yeah, of course. I mean, That's dude, great. there's so many characters on, on the show. You know what yeah. I mean? That that they're they're writing from twenty different directions. It's cool when you know if you can. They're like, yeah, help us. You know, do what you want. Yeah, make, make it better. It's a good collaborative effort. That's fantastic. And Ralph and Ralph and uh, 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 William or Billy Zabka, um, they they were they're executive producers too, and they're just like they're very easy to work with. I mean, it was really. I mean, I've done a few a few projects, but everything on this set, everybody was just cool, man. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and you hear it, but if you work on uh, projects a while, you do see that there are those. Don't make eye contact, you know, that type of person. It's just weird how quickly the, the world moves because, like, when when you and I, when I was lucky enough to open for you in La Jolla, you know, a, a decade plus ago, when I was starting out, we, we, YouTube wasn't around and Twitter wasn't around yet. Here, Brett's on a show that's on YouTube, talking about another show on YouTube, <laughs> and we're going to take some live Twitter questions right now to close out the show. Our first one comes from Stoffer Papima at Panther, and they actually ask a very Karate Kid-centric question, which maybe Brett... Or rogue? I don't know the answer to this, Perry. The question is, since the rules state a kick to the face is illegal, <laughs> oh, shouldn't Daniel have well been then. disqualified for kicking his opponent we, in the face at the end of Karate Kid <laughs> when he does the famous... That is kick? addressed in the, in, the, uh, in the show. Yeah. They talk about that. Yeah. Okay, yeah. do you, is there any ruling? I'm not going to, no, because that'll spoil the show. Yeah, okay. they, they, yeah do, no, they no. do discuss that. But this guess what? Great. An elbow to the knee should have been a disqualification. Yeah, that's, that's the too. disqualification. You know yeah. what I mean? I mean, look, it's obviously I'm Team LaRusso for many reasons. He's my cousin. <laughs> right. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, there was a lot of things that were suspect on both sides, you know? Yeah. Okay, well, Sean Arnold uh, asked our next question on Twitter, and he says that the Bill and Ted, Bill and Ted 3 is happening, um, and they're middle-aged guys, and they have to once again track down that one song that's going to you know, save the galaxy. And he says with George Carlin not being around to mm. replace the role of Rufus in Bill and Ted, uh, who would you prefer to be that kind of spiritual guide that they have that's coming from the future? Do you want to be another stand-up comic? Do you want to be somebody from music? Who would Brett Ernst recommend? Dude, that's great. That's a great question. 
I would, I would, I would like to see. I mean, it's it's a little young. Well, I, I don't know how, how old they were then, but that'd be great if Bill Burr was. <laughs> Just thinking Bill Burr you know, would be a pretty be great. Yeah, I was thinking or Bill Sebastian. Burr, Sebastian Maniscalco <laughs> would be probably. He, the he best. goes, I don't listen to this. <laughs> What's the song they're looking for? Is it going to be mumble rap? That they're I have no idea. Trap right, music. It's, it's one song they've been trying to write it for 25 years. Yeah. They still can't quite get a handle on it. Um, we'll do one more live Twitter question and then we will uh, we'll call it a day here. Um, Vincent says, uh, where would you place Infinity War in your oh. best MCU movie? So without giving away any spoilers about the movie, you did get a chance to see Infinity War. Yeah, of War. course. I, I talked to Brett this or this last week about um, <laughs> if he could come on Movie Talk on Friday. And then Brett's like, well, it's my birthday. And my wife oh. said, what do you want to do for your birthday? And I said, I want to eat pizza and watch Infinity War. So. And she goes, what are you, turning 12? <laughs> like, I literally had a 12-year-old birthday party. I'm like, this is what I want to do. <laughs> Got a little hat with balloons. <laughs> but you saw Infinity War. Yes. So would you And put I know that, the comics as well. Would you put that like up near the top of your favorite comic book movies of all time? Um, it's that, I mean, it's hard to say. It's like a culmination of everything. I mean, because there's a lot, again, there's a lot going on. Uh, it's definitely, it's definitely top 10. I would say seven, six mm. for me. Six, six seven, seven, not quite sneaking into the top I don't, five I mean, yet, it's hard but. to say, but it, it's, 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 I love it. It's great. Mm. But it, you know, there's, I mean, I liked, uh, Logan. It's yeah. Like my favorite comic book movie. Number oh, one. Okay. Absolutely. All right. Logan yep. was tremendous. Yes. Uh, you've watched that movie like 50 times. <laughs> I'm, that... I'm up to 30 or 40. I'm Logan up to 40 at least. That's a deep breath. <laughs> yes, I would have to because of what Brett just pointed out. You have to have seen all the other movies to really appreciate Infinity War. You don't have to do that with Logan. You understand this guy's struggle. It's just he happens to be a superhero. He happens to be Wolverine. But what he's going through is a struggle of any human being and that kind of thing of, of facing getting old. Yeah, he's so it's just, got so adamantium it's universal. In, his, yep. in his skeleton. But at the end of the day, he's just a limo driver, maybe hoping to get the <laughs> yeah. to take Perry and I. To now he's, oh, did you hear? He works for Lyft now. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's an Uber. <laughs> he's Small just, things is only yeah, going to afford. A, a angry and uh, uh, Perry. Where are you throwing uh, <laughs> Infinity War into your? T- does it be Logan? We're, we're for talking you? comic book now and not just MCU. I've expanded the question. Mm. I've taken the source material oh, and I've altered the canon. It's top five for me. Before, just before, but go ahead. It, it, I finally wrapped my head around the MCU rankings, and I know it's in my top five there. Oh, overall, wow. yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, really, I, I would put Logan ahead of it too if I'm talking mm. about all super hero movies but that is an unprecedented achievement i'm not just talking about oh it's got the best script and the best performance and like all that i'm just talking about as a superhero movie lover what they accomplished in that movie is just like entertainment excitement and build up in an unprecedented way that i've never seen before so i will always give it a lot of credit for that and for for that reason Top five MCU, definitely top ten overall superhero mm. movies. Well. I, I I think I can throw it in the five in yeah. the top five. I do. Upon further review, <laughs> no, because I'm thinking about it. Five. Well, here's the thing: it's like it has, and without, I'm not going to spoil anything. But if you haven't seen it yet, put your head on the desk. <laughs> um, <laughs> it has an Empire Strikes Back ending. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know what I mean. Yeah. And and there is a second part. And if you if you followed the comic books, you know about the snap. Mm-hmm. You know, so that's not spoiling it for people who don't know. But that that was in there. I mean, there's little differences. Like I think in the comic book series, it was the the role of Hulk was actually Silver Surfer. Yeah, right. You and, know what I mean. And Adam Warlock's more in the series yes, and all that yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah. But uh, I meant they're sticking to it, and um, it's just I you know, and Thanos himself as a character, like his goal mm. is is kind of an admirable goal. Like if you're watching, it, I'm going. Yeah, I, I can see this. Yeah. I hear what he's saying, and I'm like, I'd <laughs> yeah, probably vote for this guy in 2001. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I Wait, and traffic. No. Yeah. Which is a and nice <laughs> turn Marvel's doing with their villains, because Killmonger was someone you could see his point of view. Mm-hmm. You could get why he was angry, why he was a villain, why he was doing the things he was doing. Same thing with Thanos. And maybe that's what they're changing with these villains now. You got, you're like, oh, yeah, because in the comics, it's because he's trying to impress Mistress yeah, Death. Death, and, yeah. And, but this is something completely now, different. Now, quick question. I know you guys got to wrap up. Do you think Death comes back? Like, do you th- 
I don't know if that because there's definitely a part. Two. That was you my prediction guess. for her for that Hella was going to be Mistress yeah, Death yeah. and show up in this, but she didn't. But she might be in four. She has to be. Hmm? I just like how quickly a guy who sat in the 405 traffic to get here is all on board Thanos and just like, I just want to snap my fingers and I just want to be <laughs> at the studio. He's got a point, though. <laughs> but, you know, even if I'm, I'm I'm at risk for that, I'm okay. I'll roll the dice. I got a 50-50 sh shot. <laughs> there's, a, there's a website you can do it right now. Find out if Thanos spared you, and we are going to spare you at least until tomorrow. We're going to see you back here 9 a.m. PST on a new episode of Movie Talk. I want to thank Perry Nemiroff, John Roca, and our special guest, I, Mr. Brett Ernst. I go to brettcomedy.com if you want to watch my special for free. It's a new special. I was going to mention that. So oh. it's a free special. You can go there and I'm and one of the first comics. I, I put it online for free. Shot it myself. Oh. Put it online. So you can, if you want to download it, you can own it. Uh, or leave an email, but you don't have to do anything. You can just go there and hit play. So it's and not it's like a, Cobra Kai. We get the first five minutes, but then you have to. No, pay no, you get the whole hour. You, you get, get the whole, whole hour, hour for nice. free for this one. Uh, yeah, it's like an experiment I'm doing, but I, I think so far it's been pretty good. So nice. brettcomedy.com and go check out Cobra Kai. Sorry, check out Cobra Kai. <laughs> Brett Ernst, follow him on Twitter at Brett Ernst. And if uh, you're a fan of stand-up comedy, you probably catch Brett and I arguing about something until the sun comes up in the back of the comedy store, <laughs> as we want to do. NFC East brothers for life. Go Cowboys. We will. Oh. I will not agree with that sentiment, and we will say goodbye. See you all tomorrow on Collider Movie Talk. Hey, everybody. Mark Ellis here. Thanks for watching this episode of Collider Movie Talk. You want to watch more? Then click up here, or you can click right here for more great content from Collider. And if you haven't subscribed to Collider Video, do so right now and share this vid with your friends. Thanks for watching.